Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Uh, if you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. I spoke with someone earlier uh, this week that I saw just at an appointment, and they were in the waiting room, and I recognized them from uh, being here on occasion, and she commended our church for its fervor, and uh, I was waiting for her to talk about the preaching. <laughs> <laughs> she meant the singing. <laughs> So I just wanted to convey that to the worship leaders and the worship team and the congregation that for a long time our church has been known as a good singing church, and it makes an impact uh, when people come to visit. And um, just as a reminder to you, when, when we gather corporately and we sing uh, from our hearts and we sing out in praise to the Lord, it is a spiritual offering, and it's an offering that He desires and if we are doing it from hearts that are humble, that have confessed our sin, that are rejoicing in what Christ has done, then it is an offering that is pleasing to God. He is worthy of that, and it pleases his heart. And so when you come on Sunday, please be ready to, to offer and to offer in that way. It's um, providential that we had a church history moment this morning. And when I first came here, um, I had the idea to cultivate some church history and delegated that task to Kathy Blum, primarily, and she is doing an absolutely fantastic job. So please, uh, let's just give some honor to, to that effort. Um, I do hope down the road that some of this history will be put on our website and then also, Lord willing, put into some kind of a a published book form so that we can, we can keep it for future generations. And really the feeling that gave rise to that was that I do believe we have a solid historic Baptist church here that really God planted in its inception through uh, you know, a vibrant youth ministry and that God has um, throughout the decades supplied pastors for and has grown this church. And it's important that when we look at those old photographs um, we recognize that uh, the space of time between then and now is just a reflection of God's faithfulness uh, to his church here. And that's, that's something to give thanks for, I think in a Christ-centered way to be proud of, and also to consider to be a, a real strength of this church here. There's a prevailing attitude throughout America, especially down south and on the west coast, that New England is the least churched area in America, us and the Northwest um, in Oregon and Washington. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, though, because some vibrant, healthy, good gospel ministry has been going on here, right, in New Hampshire and the Connecticut River Valley for a long time. And we're a part of that. And we plan to uh, stay a part of that and cultivate that and, and grow that. And our, our small portion of gospel ministry in the world here really does matter. It matters. Okay, lastly, for me, uh, Christmas service planning. Uh, if you want to be involved in that, we really need someone who has a heart for that ministry, who would like to uh, head it up and help organize it. Uh, if, if, if you're interested in that, see me. Typically what happens is we get into October, and October's loaded with events, and then we head towards Thanksgiving and the Christmas season, which also becomes loaded with events. And we're always in the office uh, working on things that are right in front of us. We need someone who, who has less obligations and who can look at that Christmas uh, candlelight service uh, from a few months out. So if you have a heart for that, please let me know. All right, we'll be in Acts chapter 2 for some of our time this morning. I do want to encourage you to bring a copy of God's Word to church every single Sunday. Um, I thought <laughs> yesterday about doing a little test and having everyone hold up their own copy of God's Word, but I thought the public shaming involved might not be a good thing. So if you didn't bring your Bible, um, please plan to do so on a regular basis. Um, the screen is helpful, but what I don't want to see happen is we rely completely on the screen, don't bring our Bibles, and then just kind of sit back passively and listen. It is Again, one of the long-standing distinctives of this church that we have our Bibles open and we're looking for these truths in God's Word, all right? So we'll keep the screen and we'll keep the verses up there, 
just as long as uh, everyone is committed to bringing their own copy of God's Word. And this is my particular opinion, not thus saith the Lord, but cell phones don't count. Okay. <laughs> my opinion. <Amen>. My opinion. <laughs> okay, just so long as that's clear. All right, the title for this morning's message is The Matter of Church Membership. The Matter of Church Membership. It was my plan this summer to address this topic and to take a break from Luke, and so I think now is a good time. The Matter of Church Membership. As we get into the, the Bible this morning, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this time to gather and to look into your word and to consider this important aspect of church life. And I pray that your word would be clearly represented and this theme would be clearly understood. And Lord, you would give us open hearts and ears to see how best to apply these truths to our lives. Many are here this morning with uh, unique circumstances uh, re relative to church membership. And I do pray that, um, that you would make it clear from your word what they should do. Thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray for your spirit's help uh, to preach as, and speak as I ought to. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd like to make a case for formal church membership this morning. And I'd like to begin just by a survey of, a brief survey and a narrow survey of more recent church history, because church membership has always been a distinctive and important part of Calvary Baptist Church. But broader than that, I would say it's a very significant part and always has been of the historic Baptist movement throughout church history. And if we can think about our situation today and then the very recent history of our church's uh, life, and then even going back further to uh, Baptist history in colonial America, which was significant, and then taking a step back further to Baptist history in Protestant England, and then even a step further back into the very roots of the movement in Anabaptist Germany, I think we'll find that this approach to church mem membership is common throughout those different centuries. Anabaptist was the first term used for Baptist churches in Germany, and it was simply a broad and general term applied to new churches which began to spring up as a result of the Reformation, and in particularly as a result of Martin Luther's translation of the Bible into German. We'll get to the Bible in a minute. This is just the introduction. So Luther translated the Bible into German. Now, prior to that, most of you know that the church had uh, used a Latin translation of the Bible for about a thousand years, known as the Latin Vulgate. And consequently, most of Christendom, which would have been uh, Roman Catholic believers, as well as Eastern Orthodox believers, but predominantly in Europe, Roman Catholic believers who were associated into uh, the, the Roman church by virtue of infant baptism and their heritage mostly, the majority of those quote-unquote Christians were completely biblically illiterate because most of them, unless they were wealthy or part of the Catholic clergy, could not afford formal education. And so they would go to church, the entire service would be in Latin, they would go through the traditions and rituals and go home. And that was life for a thousand years in the Catholic Church. Martin Luther, as many of you know, was a monk and then a scholar. And having rediscovered the doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone, and he did this while teaching through Romans in the original language in a class, he immediately realized the vast implications of this teaching in comparison with what the Catholic Church was teaching. And so he reformed, as you know. And one of the deep passions of Luther's heart shortly after that was to translate the entire Bible from the original language into common German so that the people of Germany could read the Bible for themselves. He translated the New Testament in 1522 and then the full Bible in 1534 and the world has not been the same since. One of Luther's 
convictions during the Reformation was sola scriptura. And it was in contrast to the authority of the Catholic Church, which was invested not just in Scripture alone, but in Scripture, church tradition, which had developed for a a thousand plus years, and in the Pope. And Luther said that the church should be based on the authority of Scripture alone. And so he translated the Bible for Germans to read. And the result was that all kinds of different churches began. Many high churches, which would have been Catholic, reformed or transformed by embracing Luther's doctrine. And this was the beginnings of the Lutheran denomination. Very different today, but the beginnings of the Lutheran denomination. And later on in, in, in a subsequent generation, the beginning of reformed denominations, which also were more reformed and transformed from the high church liturgy that they had experienced with the Catholic Church. These high churches reformed. But there are also what is referred to as low churches that arose. And by and large, this included the Anabaptists in Germany. Anabaptist simply means rebaptizer. And this was the coined phrase by the Catholic Church and by even high reformed churches about these believers. These rebaptizers were called so because they rejected infant baptism as a legitimate form of New Testament baptism. And so consequently, they would share the gospel of Christ, which they had learned from reading their German Bibles, and most of them were were farmers or merchants or peasants who had not had formal education, but they could read their Bible, understand its plain meaning, share the gospel with adults from, these, uh, from, from Catholicism, and when they came to faith in Christ, they would then baptize them as an adult by immersion in water. And so they were called Anabaptists or rebaptizers. Now there's a variety of splinter groups in this broad category of Anabaptists. And some of them, frankly, had some strange convictions. Uh, There was a a wide variety, and you can imagine the Bible being brand new, people reading it for themselves, they come to different interpretations and different convictions. One example would be Amish, the the Amish denomination began in this sort of sea of Anabaptists in Germany, and they do have some very distinct and I would say strange distinctives. This is where Baptists began. And this distinctive of baptizing mature believers who had an awareness of repenting from their sin and placing their faith in Jesus Christ and an awareness of the gospel and a willingness to confess this publicly and then embrace a believer's baptism in immersion, even if it involved persecution, and it did from the very early days of the Anabaptists, this is where Baptists began. And that also associated them with these Baptist churches as members. Now this movement then moved on into Europe and in particular in England. And Baptists in England rose during the same time as movements like Puritanism. And then from there, it moved over to the American colonies. And as you know, and many of you know, most New England colonies were established as colonies who had declared a kind of state religion. And so just like England went back and forth on their state-sponsored religion, sometimes Catholic, sometimes Anglican, when the Puritans moved to Massachusetts, it was a Puritan colony. New Hampshire was congregational. Connecticut was congregational, Vermont was congregational, and that's just the American version of Puritan. Rhode Island was Baptist, and some of the early Baptist leaders there were instrumental in establishing a separation of church and state, as well as establishing um, schools for the Baptist denomination. But no doubt, in America and in American evangelicalism, as the movement grew and spanned these denominations, this approach to baptism has been the most widely embraced understanding of baptism uh, in the church today. And it's because of these early convictions of Baptists. 
Membership, then, in Baptist churches has always been wedded to this distinction. And the ideal from the very beginning is that local church membership, ideally, should be made up of 100% generally spirit-wrought converted believers in Jesus Christ. In other words, since the very beginning for a Baptist church, the idea is that the membership of the church consists of, and everyone worshiping and observing the Lord's Supper consists of 100% believers, those who have repented and placed their faith in Jesus Christ and have public, publicly confessed this and been baptized by immersion. Now, that might sound strange to you because like I said, largely today in evangelical churches, that's kind of an assumption about church membership, but not historically. Other denominations, in other denominations, this was not the case. Luther reformed the church, but did not reform to that extent, and so he continued to baptize infants. Likewise, even today, in the most orthodox and the most Bible-believing Presbyterian churches, they will still baptize infants. In congregationalism, in early America, it was still the same. And the net result is that the membership of the church then is somewhat marbled and split. You have adult believers who are active members, but then also you have at least their children who are considered to be members of the church or in Presbyterianism, members of the covenant community who have actually not yet turned from sin, believed in Christ, and been baptized as believers. And so you have a blended kind of membership. In fact, this is the essence of the controversy which found Jonathan Edwards, of all people, fired from his church in Northampton, Massachusetts. Greatest American theologian ever. <laughs> and it was because that church had a blended membership. And after a generation, after his, his father-in-law died from the being the senior pastor there, Jonathan Edwards took over. And after about uh, the duration of his time there, I think around 20 years or so, they had more non-saved members, the children had grown up, compared to the members who were actually saved. This is a recipe for a theologically liberal and dead church. Okay, now that I may have stepped on some toes, we're in a Baptist church, so it's okay. We're good company here. So this has historically been, the point is, this has historically been a critical distinctive of evangelical Baptist churches down through the ages. And they have sought this kind of local church membership that really, in essence, reflects heavenly membership in Christ's body. And we'll talk about that more in a moment, the universal church and the local church. But let me just show you a couple references where this theme emerges. Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. Philippians chapter 4, verse 3. Just in passing, yes, I ask you, true companion, help those women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers. And here's the key phrase, whose names are in the book of life, whose names are in the book of life. Now, this phrase and theme emerges in the book of Revelation six times. Let me just give you the references there. Revelation 3, 5, Revelation 13, 8, 17, 8, 20, 12, 20, 15, and 21, 27. Six times in Revelation is a reference to this kind of heavenly enrollment of believers in Christ's universal church. So for example, Revelation 21, 27, towards the end of the book, describing the new heavens and the new earth, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This conveys the notion of a heavenly roster whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. The name of the person from whichever time period in church history who has graduated to heaven in this final aspect of the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth. The person himself, their name, their number, who are all known by God according to his foreknowledge and election of them and his omnipotent power to save them to the end. 
and his omniscience to know them all, every single one, we get this picture with this book of life that there is indeed a heavenly kind of enrollment. I think this picture of the church is in Revelation 7, 9 through 10, where it describes this great multitude which no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and tongue worshiping there before the Lamb. There is a heavenly enrollment. And so, historically, a Baptist churches have, uh, have held to membership, and the idea would be to see that in the local church, in this place and at this time, that the membership of the church, those who are here and committed to this fellowship and to worshiping here and to serving Christ here, that it reflects that your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In this sense, there is a concurrence between the universal church and also the local church. Now, worship on Sundays corporately is to reflect this ideal. In heaven, there will be this innumerable multitude gathered together that worship Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the end goal of our salvation. And here we're to have an aim for a glimpse of that ideally. In our communing together with, uh, in observing the Lord's Supper is to reflect this ideal as well as our relationships of love to one another. And, and so this is an important part of Calvary Baptist Church today. In the last year or so, we've experienced a, a fairly significant amount of people coming to church here and on a fairly regular basis. And honestly, it's, it's been an encouragement, I think, to a lot of people. And the reason I'm making this a priority this summer is because <clears throat> I think in general, church membership is a priority for every Christian. And it's part of my responsibility as a pastor to emphasize the importance of church membership and to convey its significance to you biblically. Now, don't get me wrong, joining a church officially is a big decision. And so I think in general, it should take maybe three months minimally to around a year to decide to formally commit to and join a local church. It's kind of like dating or courting, right? Less than three months and you're kind of like, yeah, I don't know if you should get married just yet. But by a year, that would be good. Two years, you're kind of pushing it a little, right? Unless you have a long distance relationship. It's an important decision, and there is a kind of significant commitment that you're making to the local church. So if that's you and you've visited for that prolonged amount of time, that's okay. Take your time to make a good decision. But know that the end goal would not be, at least according to, to our convictions at this church, for you to continue to attend without making that decision one way or another. If there are aspects of our church which would uh, dissuade you from joining as a member, then we would recommend you start visiting other churches in order to make that decision elsewhere because we believe it's such an important part of living the Christian life. So if that's you, please be sure that you take some time to find out what you need to find out in order to make that decision. It's kind of like dating, right? Big decision to get married in that process I need to find out what I need to find out about the person to make that kind of commitment. This morning, I'd like to offer or begin with four foundational principles presented in the New Testament that make church membership a necessary part of a healthy church and a healthy Christian walk. So as we think about this, just keep in mind that I, I, I have the, the, the motivation to do this because I think it's healthy for you as an individual Christian and I think it's healthy for our church corporately and long-term. So if, if we diminish this as a church, what will inevitably happen is that we will have less and less actual members and more and more just attenders, and the order of the church and the proceedings of the church and finding people to minister in the church will just start to downgrade. There will be a trend. There's, there's a benefit for the church as a whole long term to emphasize this. And as we'll see, there's a benefit for you as an individual Christian. This is part of a healthy walk with Christ. Now, to begin, I want to start with um, a couple of definitions. 
two sort of qualified definitions or corrected definitions, and then three clear biblical definitions so that we know what we're talking about here. The first is the word membership. When I say membership in a church, I don't mean membership in the same way that you would become a member of a gym or some kind of a country club to play golf or an honor society or a fraternity or something like that. That's not what we mean. Those things are voluntary. Sometimes those things include a kind of secret handshake or uh, certain merits to get into the club and you enjoy a certain additional benefits. That's not what I mean. Also, when we say church, we obviously don't mean the building. We don't mean necessarily sort of the external organization. The church in the New Testament is ecclesia, and it means assembly or congregation. So when we say a member of the congregation, it is you joining that assembly formally and covenanting in some sense to those relationships that are there. And so when we talk about church membership, the phrase, we have to realize that we mean those words in a biblical way rather than kind of a casual contemporary English way, the way we use them in our day-to-day language. And also, there are three biblical definitions of the church that I think are helpful on this topic as well. Most of you know these terms. The first is the universal church, the universal church. This refers to the unseen, invisible corporate identity of all people who have been regenerated and saved by Jesus Christ. This is the universal church. Sometimes it's called the invisible church because ultimately it is God and Christ who know who those people are and where they are and when they are at a given moment on planet Earth. And they're all, they're out there all throughout the globe. That's the universal church. This is taught in the New Testament alongside of the truths about the local church. For example, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. And so Paul here is talking about the human body as a metaphor. We have many different distinct members of our body, but they're all one body. He says, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized, and that's talking about spirit baptism, into one body. So the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit is what places you spiritually into this body of Christ, and it is one. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether they're slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. That's talking about our salvation. And it, play, it unifies us to Christ. This is the universal church. Paul teaches, teaches this as well in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. There is this universal unity to Christ's church. That's the universal church. But there's also the local church. And this then is the earthly, temporal, geographic, and necessarily restricted expression of the universal church. All right? Let me say that again. The local church is the earthly, temporal, sort of geographically defined, and necessarily restricted expression of the universal church. And it's just makes sense, right? We cannot live the Christian life everywhere at all times, right? We live it somewhere. We receive God's commands from the New Testament and the Great Commission and how we should do church, and we should do that where we are. That's the pattern in the New Testament. That's the local church. And we see this implied, made explicit throughout the New Testament. The headings of all Paul's epistles are most of them to the churches. He describes and defines them both by in universal church terms and in local church terms. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Notice how both are side by side. Paul called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God 
and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Universal church or local church? Local, right? To the church, which is at Corinth. But then to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, those are universal church kind of distinctives and points of identity for them. And then he includes with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Both aspects of Christ's church are there side by side. Paul mentions the universal church, and then also he's addressing these believers who are at Corinth in that place and at that time. Same thing in 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. And then he says, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. That's the sort of county that Corinth is established in. So the broader region. Galatians 1, there he refers to the churches of Galatia. Again, a broad region geographically. And we, 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 we know that there were small local churches scattered throughout that region. And again, in Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, and again in Romans 1.7, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul assumes that they understand that they are this local church identified as worshiping believers in those locales. These believers assemble in a specific location at a specific time period who commonly express their faith in Christ. They worship him. They serve him. They serve one another and they extend the gospel and the gospel mission through their local church. And by the way, it's not just Paul who addresses and sees the churches this way. In Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus Christ addresses seven local churches in exactly the same way. Um, um, this is what uh, is said to the angel of the church in Ephesus and Smyrna and Sardis and Laodicea, Philadelphia. The reason I bring this up is because oftentimes in discussions of church membership, there is in the mind of a believer a false dichotomy, a false contrast, an unnecessary pitting against one another of the universal church and the local church. I don't have to join and be a member of the local church because, after all, I'm a member of Christ's universal church. There's a semblance of logic to that, but it doesn't reflect the logic of the Apostle Paul or of Christ or of the New Testament. So this phrase church membership, let me define it for us. Church membership with these truths in mind is the commitment of an individual Christian to fellowship, to worship, to minister within and through a local temporal assembly of other believers in willing submission to its leadership. I would be blessed if you could write that down. <laughs> I will. I'll say it a couple more times. Church membership, my, this is my definition, I'll give you someone else's in a moment, is the commitment of an individual Christian to fellowship, and I mean that in the New Testament sense of the word, not just having a good time or shooting the breeze or that's socializing, and that's a good thing, but it's not, it's not all that's involved in Christian fellowship. Church membership is the commitment of an individual Christian to fellowship, worship, minister within and through a local assembly of other believers, comma, in willing submission to its leadership. I hope we'll be unpacked this morning and also next week and maybe a third week there's two parts really to that definition. The commitment of an individual Christian to fellowship, worship, minister within and through a local assembly of other believers. First half. And that really is looking at this topic of membership through, through your eyes as an individual member. But the second half, I think, is, is equally important and also is equally evidenced in the New Testament, and that is in willing submission to its leadership. And that I'm going to ask you next week or in the week following to, to change the perspective from your perspective as a member to now considering, and just being considerate, or considering in trying to follow these themes in the New Testament, 
the perspective that a church leader would have on this subject of church membership. And I'll, it's, it's in the New Testament. Like, so, for example, <laughs> the pastoral epistles are written to church leaders. And there are themes related to church membership for Timothy and Titus there. And they have to consider this topic from their perspective as leaders. And I think in our uh, dealing with the subject, I would ask you to do the same. All right, so that's our working definition. Let me give you a similar one, but from a published author, Jonathan Lehman, in his Nine Marks book on church membership. Church membership is a formal relationship between a church and a Christian, characterized by the church's affirmation and oversight of a Christian's discipleship and the Christian's submission to living out his or her discipleship in the care of the church. Very similar. Those two halves are also represented in his definition. So that all being said, with our terms now defined, I'd like to begin laying down these four foundational principles that I think are demonstrated and evidenced in the New Testament that make church membership a necessary part of, health, of a healthy church and a healthy Christian life. First of all, as I look at the New Testament, Church membership is an inevitable outcome of faith in Christ. Church membership is the inevitable outcome of faith in Christ. We see this right off the bat in elements of local church membership in the book of Acts, particularly the very first church. So we read from Acts 2 this morning. I'd like to invite you to turn there now. Acts chapter 2, most of you know the context that here is, it's the day of Pentecost and um, God uh, demonstrates uh, e evidence of his church by pouring out the Holy Spirit. That's evidenced by the apostles speaking in tongues in known languages uh, from people that had, Jews that had gathered there from throughout the Mediterranean world. And at the high point of it, Peter stands up and preaches the gospel to them. And the result is in verse 37 and 38. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As the passage goes on, notice the amazing response in verse 41. Luke concludes here, so then those who had received his word were baptized and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. And we can ask the question, added to what? That day, they were added about 3,000 souls. Added to what? There's a number there, which implies that someone was counting. Prior to that, there had been gathered together there in Jerusalem about 100 to 150 disciples of Christ, sort of huddled together. This event of Pentecost, now there's this massive ingathering of souls to the church. What were they added to? The universal church or the local church? Both. <laughs> Who said it? <laughs> both. They're added to both. Of course, they're added to the universal church through repentant faith in Christ, but they are no doubt also added to this very first church in Jerusalem, where it was located. At that time, there's no need for a false dichotomy. Both are in view. And we find that again reiterated later in the passage. Jump down to verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, there is just so much packed into this summary that Luke gives about this very uh, early church. But notice that in, in the beginning, all of these things are conveyed almost as a kind of spiritual instinct of these new believers. Most of them, thousands of them, had not been there for the majority of Christ's ministry. 
and yet they begin to do these things which have been essential to every church down through the ages. They devote themselves to teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, I think a reference to the Lord's Supper, and to prayers. At that time, the, the, the gospel was being confirmed by miracles done by the apostles, which contributed to more being saved. They were sharing uh, their, 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 their possessions with one another according to people's need. This was daily. They would go to the temple together. Again, no church building. They're using a portion of the temple to assemble. This is happening in homes. And also, it says, in conclusion, the Lord added to their number day by day. Now, there's a little bit additional detail here. Added to what? The local church or the universal church? Luke here specifies added to their number day by day, which I think is a slight emphasis on the local church. Again, their number was being calculated. When people were baptized, especially then, Baptism in Jesus' name made an unmistakable distinction between Jewish people. These are all Jews, and they're all in the temple. How would they be distinguished as Christians particularly? Through their baptism in the name of Christ. And that baptism inevitably associated them with the Jerusalem church, the other believers at Jerusalem. And this is an inevitable outcome an overflow of their faith. It's not super formal. It's not coached necessarily by the apostles. It's almost a spiritual instinct for them to gather together, to identify and associate with one another in order to worship Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so baptism is even wedded here to church membership in the very first church in Jerusalem. Now, that should be enough here in Acts chapter 2, but as Luke continues to write the book of Acts and church history starts to unfold here in this book, we find that similar themes come out in how Luke describes the early church. For example, um, if you turn over to Acts chapter 4, <clears throat> this is when Peter and John are arrested. It's right after Peter's second sermon. <clears throat> As they were speaking, verse 1, to the people, it says, The priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were preaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it is already evening. Verse 4, But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Again, the same theme, same author recording what had happened here in Jerusalem, and now the church is uh, above 8,000. By the time we get to Acts chapter 6, a need arises for the impartial distribution of provisions for the widows that were at the church. Notice Acts chapter 6, and this is where uh, the first deacons are established. Now in those days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution, which implies that there are a finite amount of resources that had been given to meet the needs of people in the church, and there were also an understood amount of people and widows in the church, and the distribution of it had to be even. And it wasn't. It was biased. The bias was in favor of those Jews who lived in Israel and around Jerusalem versus those Jews who had moved there from other countries in the Mediterranean world. The ones who were true Jews from Israel were being favored, and this shouldn't have been so in the church. And so the deacons are established to oversee the distribution to widows in this massive church, right? 8,000 plus. And again, we get the picture here that this is all local and those people, all of them, are identified with this church. Here, the widows in particular, who are now benefiting from their membership in that local church. In Acts 8, just another sort of indirect, indirect uh, allusion to their membership. And I think this, this, this starts to paint church membership as, 
in a certain light that we're not used to here in America. Acts chapter 8, verse 3. But Saul, you know, became the Apostle Paul very soon in Acts 9. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went abroad preaching the word. Right? This is the first persecution that arises there against the Jerusalem church. And it is led by this very young, zealous Saul, a zealous Pharisee. He was ravaging the church. How? It says, entering house after house. Now let me ask you a question. How does Saul know where these believers live? I mean, there has to be some kind of clear, consistent identification with the church in Jerusalem by these believers for Saul to know and find out what their names are and where they live. And I'm telling you, in other countries in the world where persecution is an issue, there is also an issue of believers who will show up to worship consistently while under threat of persecution versus those who will not because they're afraid. In fact, I ran into a, a missionary during my time in seminary who was a missionary in Jordan, and he was uh, actively involved in converting Muslims to Christ. And he had one young Muslim man who made a profession of faith in Christ and out of fear of being persecuted by his family in the mosque, he refused to make that public. And it went on for some time, back and forth, back and forth. He wouldn't get baptized. And so finally, in contrast to most contextualization methods in missions, he said to him, you know what? You are not even worthy to be a follower of Christ. Jesus said, this is part of following him. Do you understand? In Hebrews, we have an example where these Jewish believers who had made a public profession of Christ and identified with other believers are now, are now being persecuted and their homes are being ransacked and some of them are withdrawing from that identification and shrinking back into the synagogues so that they can avoid the persecution. It just paints this in a whole different light. These Jerusalem believers were members of the church there and because of that, Saul was able to identify them go to their house, and then persecute him, persecute them. This is not explicit. If you're, if you're expecting in the New Testament there to be truths about um, being part of the church, right? The universal church, the local church, but then expecting there to be some extra chapter about formal membership in the church, you're approaching it the wrong way. There is this underlying assumption in the context of the entire New Testament that when you come to faith in Christ, it is inevitable that you will assemble with a body of believers in a, in a specific place at a specific time to live the Christian life. And that's why it's so important. Even the Apostle Paul is an example of this. If we just look at his life as an individual believer, Paul is converted in Acts chapter 9 and very much converted outside of the local church, right? A lot of times people are converted within. We preach the gospel, we invite people to respond with repentance and faith, they become a Christian. Not so for the Apostle Paul, right? He's riding to Damascus to persecute Christians, and Jesus, the risen Christ, appears to him on the road to Damascus, casts him down from his horse, a bright light appears, and he speaks to him from heaven. If there is any believer that could have said, hey, Christ called me to ministry, was outside the local church. I'll minister in, in local churches, but I'm not becoming a part of the local church. It could have been Paul, right? He could have said, I don't need to submit to your authority. I'm under Christ's authority. That is not what happened in his life. The very first weeks, uh, the very first week, it says in Acts 9, 19, now for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. This is right after he's converted. What does he do? He finds the disciples who are closest to him in Damascus. He's with them there. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue. So he immediately starts his, his ministry that Christ called him, saying, he is the son of God. And it says, all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Paul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. 
And this gave rise now to the Jews starting to persecute Paul. And so he flees Damascus and he goes back down to Jerusalem. Notice what it says in Acts 9, 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. And he's trying to associate, connect with, become sort of uh, enveloped into the membership of that church there in Jerusalem. And because of his past of persecuting them, they wouldn't let him. Later on, when Saul is, is taken, from, he ends up in Tarsus, where he had been from, and eventually when the church in Antioch begins, <clears throat> uh, Barnabas, who was a delegate and from the church in Jerusalem, goes and grabs Paul. He, he knows about his conversion and his gifting, and he brings him over to Antioch. And it says there, for an entire year they met with the church, taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So now Paul is there. And he becomes well-established as a leader and teacher of the church. His apostolic uh, ministry is still unfolding. After some time, while Paul was there at Antioch, Barnabas is there. This is Acts 13.1. Simeon, Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, and Saul, they're all there as leaders of the church. This is their sort of elder board. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then, as you know, they fasted and prayed, and they sent out Barnabas and Paul, laying their hands on him. And it says, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and they began his first missionary journey. Now, here again, we can ask, who is sending Paul, God or the church? It's both. Thank you. It's both. It's both. And even the Apostle Paul, far from disregarding the role of the local church, he is there in Antioch. He is teaching, exercising his gifts alongside of other elders. And yes, God has a calling for him. And that calling is made uh, formal and official. And he is sent out with their hands laid on him when the Holy Spirit collectively says to them, set apart Barnabas and Saul for, for the work I've called them to. They affirm that. They send him out. He goes out on his first missionary journey. And when he's done, where does he go back to? Antioch. Because that's his church. At least for the time being. And so all throughout the New Testament, we see this kind of interweaving of a, a strong relationship to a local church both in the first church in Jerusalem, and then even if we look at the local church's role for ministers of the gospel, the Apostle Paul, and there's also others that we can consider. For example, Epaphroditus is called Paul's brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, but he's also called a messenger, or the word is apostolos, a lowercase apostle of the church of Philippi. They sent him. That was his church, his local church, where he was a member of, likely where he had been saved. Titus is described the same way, and other uh, uh, fellow workers in, in 2 Corinthians 8.23, messengers or delegates or sent out ones of the churches where they had come from. Timothy is exactly the same way. Well, <laughs> that's our first point in this series. Church membership always was, it seems to me, in the book of Acts and then throughout the epistles, this assumption, when someone was saved and they were baptized, it identified them with Christ, which inevitably identified them with other believers in these local churches, in their areas, and they were associated with them. Our context is a little different, right? We have quite a variety of things to choose from. Lots of churches out there. Nevertheless, for living the Christian life, it's most healthy, and you fulfill most of the New Testament's commands for how you're to live when you become a member of the local church. Amen. Our second point goes on to look at the one another commands of the New Testament, which we'll look at next week because we're out of time. This is the will of God for every individual believer in you relating to your local church and for everyone else around you. 
It's rich, it's involved, it's invested. We cannot do that well without becoming committed members. And that's the second point we'll, we'll begin uh, next week. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray for um, these truths from your word to be considered. I do pray that um, this instinct to associate with and worship with other believers uh, would be uh, just the overflow of our hearts and would lead to uh, decisions toward membership here of those who have been attending for some time. I do thank you for the members we have and uh, the strong uh, relationships that have been cultivated here in our body. And I do pray, Lord, that you would continue that work in order to strengthen us as a church for the ministry you've given us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.